Hi, everybody. Thank you for joining us for this panel on Centering Justice, Diversity, Equity, and Inclusion in Science Policy. The event is organized by the Journal of Science Policy and Governance and will feature early career authors published in the recently re released special topics issue and policy memo competition on intersectional science policy. The special issue is sponsored by the National Science Policy Network and supported by the Society for Advancement of Japanos, Hispanics, and Native Americans in Science, SACNIS, 500 Women Scientists, and the National Society for Black Engineers. So I'm gonna share the link to the, the special issue here for you all to look at this as we're speaking. And my name is Adriana Bankston. I'm currently the CEO of Managing Publisher for the Journal of Science Policy and Governance, and I'll be moderating the discussion today. Uh, you can follow me on Twitter at Adriana Bankston and JSPG at Sightball Journal. So if you go to the next slide, I wanna provide a little bit of background on the journal for those that may not be familiar. So here's our website. Uh, you can check it out again as we're speaking. We are an internationally recognized open access and peer reviewed publication. We cover every corner of science and technology policy. And through the journal, we bolster research and writing credentials for early career scholars in science policy, encourage them to engage in science policy discourse and debate. And then go to the next slide. Uh, we publish a variety of formats, OPEDs, technology assessments, policy memos, analyses, white papers, book reviews, workshop proceedings, and other research articles. And you can see here a list of the topics that we publish on. You're welcome to browse this on our website as well. And we promote the publications through our global mailing list, as well as events such as workshops, webinars, and the podcast, where we interview published authors. You can follow us on Twitter, Facebook, and Instagram. We also have a YouTube channel where we post all of our recordings. So I'm going to share our accounts um, in the chat so you can, you can um, keep connected with JSPG. Um, and we encourage you to sign up for the newsletter where you can keep up with uh, future events as well. So next slide, just to cover a few logistics. Um, uh, this has already been said, but if you can keep your microphones muted until uh, um, otherwise, um, to reduce background noise and then keep your videos off as well. Uh, obviously this is being recorded and will be shared on YouTube later. Um, so in terms of our special issue, we would like to encourage you to follow GSPG as well as the partners on the issue, NSPN, SACNIS, 500 Women Scientists and NSB, and use the hashtag ISPMC2021 for the issue and ISCS, uh, sorry, ICSCS21 for the conference. Um, hashtags are here. Um, if you'd like to uh, tweet, feel free to tweet about the session and tag us. Uh, we can amplify you. So with that, um, we'll move on to the panel. Um, go to the next slide, thank you. Um, so our panelists today will describe their policy memos published in JSPG. They will talk about diversity, equity, and inclusion in a variety of contexts, including remote work that we are all experiencing now, as well as education and training and federal funding. Their memos will describe both challenges and solutions that they came up with to address these important topics in science policy, both in Canada and the US. So in the order um, of this slide, um, Emma Anderson is one of our, our first presenters. She's a master's student in bioresource engineering at McGill and a member of the Science Policy Exchange Canada. And she will talk about decolonization of STEM education in Canada. Ashley Orr is a PhD student and NSF GRFP fellow at Carnegie Mellon uh, Heinz College in Pennsylvania. And she will talk about access and equity and remote work in light of the pandemic. And finally, Danarsri Mariboina is a PhD candidate at McMaster University and a member of the Toronto Science Policy Network. And she will talk about accessibility of federal graduate research awards in Canada. So let's start with Ashley. Uh, if you want to present your slides. Sure thing. Uh, thanks for being here, everyone. Uh, my name is Ashley Orr, as Adriana mentioned, and I wrote this memo with a fellow PhD student, student Tamara Savage, who's unable to join us today. We were really excited to um, embark on this work in part, in part because 
um, I study labor economics and Tamara studies technology forecasting and, and um, technology policy. And so what was clearly um, apparent from the pandemic is that technology enabled this drastic increase in the shift to remote work and, um, and allowing more workers to, to work remotely during the pandemic than ever before. However, this, this technology really favored those whose, whose jobs were telecommutable. And the privilege of having a job that is, is telecommutable is also associated with other, um, with other socioeconomic um, categories. And so, so the takeaway, one of the takeaways from our memo is that access to remote work, to, to engaging together here on Zoom, to, to having high-speed internet, that it's unevenly distributed across the population. We focus on the US, but these results are pretty generalizable globally as well. There's many benefits associated with this technology and, and the ability to engage and work remotely from our homes or from, or from our communities. And, and many of those benefits accrue not only to the firms. So think about productivity gains or cost savings. They're, they're not having to, to manage those big offices and keep the electricity on, the heat on, that sort of thing. But there's also, well, there's also benefits to the workers. Particularly, um, workers are able to save time by avoiding costly commutes and parking and, and, and car wear and tear and avoiding congestion. But there's also advantages to a, a disadvantaged or, or historically excluded portion of the workforce, which are family carers. So think mothers or folks who are doing elder care or child care for their family. So we were both excited, but also a bit worried about the expansion in remote work because some early studies indicated that there are risks for exacerbating existing inequalities, mainly that remote work was coming along with a, with a stigma, a flexibility stigma, where workers who were engaging remotely may, may um, carry this stigma and then may not be treated equally in terms of promotion or assessment in their, in their position. So our goal with this memo was to, to respond to one, the uneven access in remote work, which you can see in this figure here on the left-hand side of your screen, where folks with advanced degrees and in higher education are much more likely to be engaging in work remotely over Zoom or other um, online technologies, and whereas for folks who are lower educated do, did not have that option during the pandemic. And then also to respond to the potential risk that remote workers may be treated differently compared to their in-office peers in, in the case of promotion and assessment. And our recommendation was to expand the Federal Telework Enhancement Act to include firms in the private sector. So there's our actual federal rulemaking, which allows and supports remote workers that are, that, are, um, that are public workers, that are federal government workers. And so our goal was to expand that legislation to cover all the workers in the US. So what are the takeaways? So if we hop on to the to the next slide, I'd like to sort of to sort of expand out even further from remote work and think about technology policy more general. And, and my the question I want to ask you and I want you to, to think about is why is complementary policy necessary in science and technology? And the answer that I have for that is that, of course, science and technology are going to advance, often advance to solve societal problems and scientific problems. But these advancements will not uniformly benefit society. And, and I, that's not a critique of the science and that's not a critique uh, uh, of the technology. But it is important for us to engage in systematic evaluation to understand how advancements in science and tech are gonna interact with existing social and policy problems, particularly to understand if they exasper as exacerbate existing inequalities, like in the case of remote work, where we have Folks who uptake remote work or prefer remote work are often those with family caring responsibilities, and that those are the same, same groups which may be disadvantaged in the labor market before. And then we also need to acknowledge that technology and, and science, uh, science advancements may also create new problems or, or problems or new challenges. So think about the infrastructure we need to maintain ar around remote work in my specific memo's case. And often private action, individual action, the individual firms acting together, and even the market will fail to address some of the equity concerns associated with this, with this advancement, particularly whenever they privilege or disadvantage groups. And that's why we need systematic evaluation, where both the science, the technology, and the research advances jointly with the policy in order to protect um, equity across workers to expand inclusion and to address market failures, help for firms and workers coordinate. That's all I have. I think I'll turn it over to, to Adriana. 
Thank you, Ashley, for that presentation. So I have a few general questions to frame this a little bit for the audience. So um, your memo shows that individuals from certain socioeconomic backgrounds are unable to work from home. Women are also disadvantaged, as we've seen in multiple aspects of the pandemic. Um, in your memo, you talked about the Telework Enhancement Act. Can you explain a little bit more about that and how your memo addresses it? Yeah, absolutely. So the Telework Enhancement Act, um, it, it was it was implemented to to focus only on public employees. So these are federal employees. These are folks who work for the state and the national government. And the idea of this act was to expand access to remote work. So so federal employees work with their hiring managers and, and with their section of government in order to evaluate whether or not the, the work that they do is telecommutable. And if that work is in fact tele telecommutable, meaning that it's possible to be conducted at some place other than the site of, of, the, of the federal agency, then that worker gains the right or, or the access to work remotely if they would so choose. So that's the first thing is that this act allows for an expansion in the folks who can um, telework so, and allowing anyone who, whose job can be tele telecommutable to do so. The second part refers to promotion and assessment of workers. And this is where we think it's particularly important if we see telework and, and um, remote work to persist far after the pandemic, as many of the estimates um, and predictions are, are indicating. Because if we have workers who choose to telework because that is the, the best choice for them, what we don't want is that those workers to carry a stigma, particularly if those workers are from disadvantaged groups. And, and the, the act, what it does is it sets out clear standards for promotion and assessment, which um, evaluates in-person workers on the same standards at which you would evaluate workers who are engaging in the work remotely. And this ensures that if mothers, for instance, have a higher take up of remote work, compared to, to other employees, that then they aren't penalized whenever they go up for promotion because they decided to uptake remote work that was that it was offered to them. Does that help? Great, right, thank you. Yes, that's really important and very timely. Uh, so I want to ask you a little bit looking into the future, um, you know, in terms of remote work and the future of work. Uh, what do you think this will look like in a year from now, assuming we're back in person, uh, pandemic is over, maybe we'll be in a hybrid situation. Um, and in combination with this, um, in the context of this conference, how can we make sure the future of work remains equitable um, and after the pandemic ends or in the future? And then who do you think um, needs to act on these issues to ensure that, that is the case? Yeah, wow, there's a lot there. So let me take them in, in, in order or, or try to. So first, um, what do I think the future of work will look like with respect to telecommuting? Well, if we look at studies um, uh, that, are, that we cite in this paper and then also ones that have come out since the memo ha has published, what the, the prediction from survey evidence of both workers and firms are is that about one in five workers will engage in their work remotely. Um, and so, so that's around 20 to 30% of the labor force we anticipate will engage in some sort of form of remote work. Now that might not be full-time remote work, meaning every day we're at home in our home offices, but it will be a much more flexible work arrangement than what we were used to prior to the pandemic. So for instance, workers may choose to have one day where they work from their home office rather than their, their person office, or one day where they work in the in-person office. So what's clear is that this, this remote work, which we all learned how to do through this Zoom shock where we got used to engaging um, via telecommuting, that this is around, this, this will now persist. And so why is this important? It's important because that's, if it's going to persist past the pandemic, then we especially need to think about the, the, the challenges of equity and inclusion that we raise in our memo. We need to think about promotion and hiring and assessment of workers, you know, three, four, five years down the line. And how does this affect the workers who choose to engage in remote work in, 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 um, and make sure we don't already disadvantage a group that has been um, ex historically excluded from, from the labor market? Your second question, I think, was regarding, um, regarding, you know, who are the decision makers and what are the measures we need to engage in? Well, I think the, one of the key decision makers, um, if we look from the top down, of course, is, is Congress. Congress could, could act uh, and enact a similar measure to the Telework Enhancement Act that would cover all firms. And that's what we argue in our memo. 
But if we look um, sort of even more at the local scale, we might also think about the importance of the Equal um, Employment Opportunity Commission to sort of highlight whenever workers are being disadvantaged, either in their access or their promotion um, schemes according to their, their work modality. And then finally, at the very local level, I think individual workers and the firms themselves can work to protect, protect equity and expand ex inclusion for their workers. So what do I mean by that? I mean that workers can work together with their, with their colleagues to ask their hiring firms, or their HR, their human resources departments, for the privilege to, for remote work. The firms themselves can choose to offer this privilege in a hope to sort of be more inclusive to workers who might have family caring responsibilities or workers who just have a preference for the flexibility, so the, the not so rigid requirement, the eight to five show up in the office to allow for these benefits um, around avoiding commutes, that sort of thing. And then I think um, as we see more and more firms that are offering this and more and more workers that are demanding this, this will sort of incentivize the firms that are, lagged that are lagging behind and who are not um, expanding remote work to do so because the, the sort of the tides will turn and, and, and individual workers will demand it. Did I get all your, all your points? Yes, very good, very thorough answers. Thank you. So we have a couple of questions in the chat. Uh, we can address them since we have a little time. So one is about sure. um, remote work for disabled workers and what this looks like in terms of policies and recommendations that might address equity and access for this group. Do you have any comments on that? Yeah, this is something Tamara and I discussed when we were writing the memo because we had seen that the option to engage in remote to engage in remote work would um, potentially disproportionately benefit. So it would be a, an extra benefit for workers um, who workers with disabilities, particularly workers with mobility disabilities, for which commuting um, co commuting constituted a significant cost to their engagement in the labor force. And so we were really excited about the option for remote work for greater inclusion of folks who, who for which commuting would be really difficult. And then also for folks who live in, in um, economically disadvantaged labor markets. So there's lots of folks whose, you know, their labor markets may, may be um, on the decline or have had a bad shock or a hurricane or an, an adverse economic event. And, and moving to a new location would be difficult for that, that person or their family. But if they could engage in remote work, they could get a higher paying job in, a, in, a, um, in, a, in their same career, but stay where they currently are. So there's tons of, there's tons of options for remote work to, to advance inclusion in that way. Now, I think the, the, this, this, the speak, this, um, this audience question was around um, policy. And I think that has to be to has to happen um, in conjunction with the American Disabilities Act and this Equal Employment Opportunity Commission to ensure that um, that these opportunities for remote work are being protected, and um, particularly for, for for disabled workers. Did I get the question all right? Yes, very good. Thank you. Um, and one question, sort of the flip side of this, so. Um, Addressing disadvantages of remote work, limitations, fatigue of Zoom meetings, a lack of a home office, uh, how does that relate to equity and inclusion? That definitely does. And I think um, I, I, that's one thing we didn't highlight in the memo, just in the interest of space, that the Telework Enhancement Act, part of that act was actually requiring the agencies that the workers work for to evaluate with their employees about what their technology and home office setup is at home and providing them sufficient resources. So, you know, thinking like um, ergonomic, like chairs, for instance, to engage in their work or the technology to be able to bring their workstation home or the, um, or the um, internet access if they don't already have it, for instance. And so, so part of the Telework Enhancement Act was, was an evaluation where we see where, where, the, where the agencies would see if the workers have the, the resources necessary to engage in the, in the remote work. Um, with respect to the, the fatigue of Zoom meetings, um, I, I think that's, that's a really, really, um, really key point. And I think that we won't see, what we probably won't see is the high rates of remote work full-time remote work. I think there will be a more hybrid approach in the future. And so this fatigue of Zoom meetings might be able to sort of be, um, so sort of be like naturally evened out as workers engage in a sort of more hybrid approach where sometimes it's, it's um, the telecommuting and then other times it's in-person gatherings. And then of course, 
um, considering that they might meet in person whenever they're engaging in meetings, like the Zoom meeting sort of aspects, but then do the core of their work tasks, you know, the analysis whenever they're on their own. So there's not so much, much Zoom as we probably had during the pandemic. Great, thank you. Well, this is a really important topic. I think we'll be uh, around for a long time and we could go, go for, for a while, but we need to move on to our second speaker. Thank you, Ashley. And we encourage you to read the memo uh, and reach out to us if you have uh, further comments. So I'll move on to Emma Anderson. If you can advance. There we go. Good afternoon. I'm Emma Anderson. Um, I'd like to start my presentation with a land acknowledgement. I'm joining you today from the traditional territory of the Tla'aman Nation, one of the 20 coastal Salish tribes inhabiting the coastal regions of British Columbia. However, I usually reside in Jojage, also known as Montreal. It's the traditional unceded territory of the Gane Gehaga Nation. So I'm here today to talk about the memo that I wrote with a team of fellow volunteers at Science Policy Exchange. Science Policy Exchange is a student-run nonprofit that aims to facilitate the exchange of ideas on science and policy issues between students and leaders in government, industry, research, as well as the community. And our organization advocates for inclusive and evidence-based policies. So, our memo is titled Decolonization of STEM in the Public Education System in Quebec, Canada. Um, and it discusses creating space for Indigenous perspectives and ways of knowing in primary and secondary school education, so K to 12, as most of you would know it, in Quebec. I want to note that yesterday I had the pleasure of watching the keynote address by Max Liboron. And they discussed that the term, which is widely used in the educational advocacy of decolonization, is often misused and is not really the same as inclusion or reconciliation. And I want to acknowledge that the use of the term in our memo's title was misinformed and direct the writers to reading Tuck and Yang's Decolonization is Not a Metaphor, which I'll share in the chat. Um, you know, this is an inclusive SciComm conference and one of the main benefits of it is to learn and unlearn. So moving on to the memo, uh, STEM in Canada has a diversity issue and Indigenous peoples are underrepresented in STEM occupations, whereas they're 4% of the population, they're only 2% of the workforce. So one of the main barriers to increased representation of Indigenous peoples in STEM is the fact that primary, secondary, and even post-secondary education is too often only taught from a Eurocentric or Western science perspective. So Western science is often portrayed as acultural despite being embedded in and a product of Western culture. By portraying STEM education as acultural, Western science excludes non-Western ways of knowing, leading to the devaluation of indigenous beliefs experiences and knowledge in the STEM classroom. It also perpetuates the myth that Western science is the only way to do science. However, fundamentally, what is science? Science is just a way of developing an understanding of the world, whereas engineering and technology is the application of this understanding. So in this way, there's no universal methodology for science and a multicultural pluralistic approach to STEM can help challenge this myth, as well as promote a safer and more inclusive environment for participation of Indigenous peoples in STEM. So inclusion of Indigenous perspectives in STEM can also help advance reconciliation. For those of you in the US who don't know, the Truth and Reconciliation Commission was created in Canada to document the history and legacy of the government-sponsored residential school system which forcibly removed Indigenous children from their communities to isolate them from their cultures and assimilate them. The system was a mechanism for cultural genocide and responsible for the abuse, neglect, and death of thousands of children. Calls to Action 62 of the Tr Truth and Reconciliation Commission report specifically call on all levels of the government to consult with Indigenous peoples to make curriculum on Indigenous peoples' historical and contemporary contributions and perspectives, a mandatory, mandatory part of all um, 
curriculum for kindergarten to grade 12 students. While the 10th call of action calls for improving education attainment levels and success rates of indigenous students and developing culturally appropriate curricula. The benefits of inclusion of indigenous perspectives in STEM in terms of their participation in the workforce is not merely theoretical. There is a growing body of evidence in both the US and Canada that show that culturally responsible integration of indigenous ways of knowing and place-based instruction into curriculum can increase engagement and lifelong participation in STEM. However, oh, and beyond reconciliation, greater representation of indigenous peoples can also promote more equitable science policy, self-determination and economic opportunity. Um, can you go to the next uh, slide, please? However, despite these benefits and the importance of reconciliation, most provinces in Canada have not included Indigenous STEM content in their mandatory elementary and secondary STEM curriculum. This includes the province of Quebec, where I reside normally, despite the fact that Quebec is home to 10% of the Indigenous population of the territory which Shetlers refer to as Canada and 11 different Indigenous nations. So to make STEM education more inclusive in Quebec, our memo makes two recommendations to the Quebec government. First, we recommend that the Quebec's Ministry of Education create an Indigenous Education Steering Committee, which is modeled after what's been done in British Columbia, Canada, to oversee the reform of elementary and secondary STEM curriculum to integrate Indigenous perspectives into it. The committee, which would be paid positions, would consist of an Indigenous board of directors that represents the Indigenous nations of Quebec. They would be given full powers to determine which content and how to include this content in the curriculum and to legislatively protect the authority of the steering committee. We would also combine this with the amendment of the Education Act, which would stipulate that the Ministry of Education must collaborate with the steering committee to ensure the appropriate immersion of Indigenous content and perspectives into STEM curriculum. However, changing the curriculum doesn't ensure that teachers will be able to teach it. So the Education Act does, however, say that the Minister of Education can determine and impose specific policy directives or objectives on school service centers, which are basically like the school boards in Quebec through their five-year strategic plan. Therefore, we combine our first recommendation with another recommendation that calls on the Quebec government to include continued professional development training to teachers regarding Indigenous STEM content in their five-year strategic plans, which would be created in consultation with Indigenous communities, as well as the success metrics would also be identified with Indigenous communities. So next slide, please. More broadly, why is it important to have multicultural STEM education? Well, students become workers, whether they take the linear path from elementary to high school to university, or they take a different path. Top-down DEI initiatives, such as hiring policies that mandate diversity, don't often solve diversity problems in the workforce because they don't ensure that there's A, enough diverse applicants, or B, that there are safe spaces for these diverse applicants to work. To increase diversity in the STEM workforce, we really need to, to, to treat diversity as a systemic issue. There is a leaky pipeline problem where at every level of education and moving up uh, the career ladder, there is a loss or narrowing of diversity. However, to combat this problem, we can't just focus on getting more people into the pipeline, we need to investigate, examine, and combat the cultures and structures that are causing these leaks in the pipeline. This requires a mix of both bottom-up and top-down DEI approaches, whereas inclusive education is only one of many policies that should be implemented to ensure there are safe and supportive spaces for people of any background to participate in STEM. So to end off, I want to say that STEM is fundamental for shaping understanding and relationships with the world. Diversity in STEM has been shown repeatedly to lead to better decision making, not only in terms of equity, but also in terms of innovation and finding and implementing solutions to the most pressing problems of today. So thank you for listening to my presentation. I look forward to your questions. 
Thank you, Emma. This is a really uh, crucial topic, I think, to, to address um, both in the US and Canada. So, and your uh, recommendations um, do address it to an extent. So I wanna dive a little deeper into this. So obviously you talked about how it's important to include indigenous perspectives in elementary and secondary education. Um, through the creation of the steering committee, as well as um, incorporating these ideas into the Quebec Ministry of Education strategic plan. Um, can you talk a little more about how you think that these perspectives can be incorporated into the educational system? Well, I think like the main thing that needs to happen in any jurisdiction, because within Canada and the US, education is usually under the state or province jurisdiction is that the communities, the local indigenous communities need to be consulted, they need to be paid and they need to be part of the process and they need to be the ones who decide what content is put into the curriculum and how this content is incorporated into the curriculum. So I think providing the platform and ensuring that that platform is sustainable, which is why we specifically uh, recommend amendment of the Education Act um, is really key to uh, providing a, a opportunity for these um, perspectives to be included in education. But in the end, it's not up to the Quebec Ministry of Education to say what is and what isn't put into it. They need to just make the space for that. And then it's up to the local communities to um, decide what, what uh, actual content is gonna go in there and what content won't. Yeah, that makes a lot of sense. Um, so I think, um, you know, these these solutions from your memo seem really ambitious and I think it'd be really impactful. Um, so I'm curious, sort of talk about the flip side of this. Of, do you think there may be any barriers to implementing these solutions? Um, and this is something that, you know, I could see being applied to the US educational system as well. Uh, do you think that's a, an option or what are your comments on that? Yeah, that's a great question. I mean, political will is of course a huge barrier because this will require that the party who is governing the province is willing to um, commit to amending the Education Act and putting funding towards this type of steering committee or project. So that's one of the main barriers. However, in Canada with the Truth and Reconciliation Commission, we're seeing an increase in the amount of uh, settler Canadians who care about these issues and who want to take action on the calls of action in the Truth and Reconciliation Commission. So that's a, a great sign and hopefully there'll be more pressure on our politicians to implement this type of thing, even though it's already implemented in British Columbia and Saskatchewan. Um, in terms of the US, I mean, the tricky part is to find where the exact mechanism within the education acts and which within the regulations that can make this um, a sustainable lasting project. So a great example is Montana. They had article X of their constitution guarantee an edu edu equitable education for all students. In 1999, they passed bill 528 known as the Indian education for all act. And they basically clarified that an equitable education for all students includes a culturally responsive American Indian content. Um, and that's vital for an, a quality and equitable education. So it really comes down to each jurisdiction finding those specific places where amendments can be made and where uh, the law can be interpreted to help support this issue. Um, other barriers also include for example, potential pushback for teacher training and other things like that. Um, it's a very complex issue and I definitely don't have all the solutions. Yes, I think that's really interesting. And, you know, I do think it could be something that could be applied outside of Canada as well, because it looks like they're, um, I think, um, useful solutions. So, um, there's a question in the chat about the discussion between STEM and science within Western culture, uh, referring to Western science. Um, but we recognize that science is knowing the world, technology is the application of that knowing. 
uh, what is, um, however, this is not prioritized or validated within Western science. Is there a value to using the term Western science to refer to what we call science? Well, I think that's one of the reasons why it's important to include other ways of knowing as being science in elementary and secondary education, because this is going to help broaden the view of students who later on become part of the workforce on what science means, showing them that science is not like what I grew up learning, just Western science. So I think that's why our memo team saw education as a very important um, kind of area to target because by incorporating other ways of knowing and other perspectives of science into STEM education, we hopefully will broaden the views of all students. Great, thank you. Uh, well, I think this is a, a really timely topic. I'd love to chat some more, but um, we wanna move on to our th third speaker now. Thank you, Emma. Do you have three? Hi. Uh, hopefully everyone can hear me all right. So my name is Danyazri, and uh, I am a PhD student at McMaster, and McMaster is lo located on the traditional territories of the Haudenosaunee Confederacy and the Anishinaabe Nations, which are protected by the Dish with One Spoon Wampum Belt Agreement. Uh, and so uh, today I want to chat a little bit about the memo that I co-wrote with several uh, people as part of Toronto Science Policy Network. And uh, for a lot of our attendees who might not know what the Toronto Science Policy Network is, it's a student-run science policy group, which is affiliated with the University of Toronto, but anyone can be a part of it. So I don't go to UFT. I, I am a McMaster student, but um, it uh, TSPN does have a lot of volunteers across um, the Southern Ontario region in particular. And uh, TSPN provides a lot of different resources, workshops, and opportunities for students to engage and learn about science policy. Um, and while a lot of the work we do is about encouraging evidence-based, science-based policymaking, um, TSPN also provides a really good space for students, and in particular graduate students, to advocate for policy changes within academia and the research environment within Canada. And so just to get a, give a little bit of an introduction to this memo. Um, so the topic really does focus on uh, federal graduate research awards within Canada. Um, and for people who might not be aware, within Canada, we have something known as the Tri-Council. And this is a major funding body that is pretty much in charge of allocating all major federal research awards towards graduate students, which includes master's and PhD students. And so it's, it's called the Tri-Council because it's made up of three uh, sectors, essentially. So one for uh, natural sciences and engineering, one for social sciences, and one for health sciences research. And so um, the awards that they do administer to graduate students across Canada are um, administered through the three different sections, depending on which discipline that you study under. Um, and there are inconsistencies between uh, the criteria awards uh, and values, which I'll touch upon a little bit. Uh, so that, that's just a little preamble on uh, the topic behind this um, memo. And so I want to give, I guess, a little bit of an overview of some of our motivations for writing this, um, this memo, and particularly from a graduate student perspective. And one of the first things is the idea of, you know, meritocracy within academia. So within academia and within research environments, uh, and particularly regarding, you know, scholarships and admissions to graduate programs, the metrics that are often used are GPA, research experience, publications, prior awards, and connections. But the problem with these metrics are that they're often an outcome of privilege and not individual merit. Things like your ability to have uh, good research experiences within undergrad are 
subject to a lot of different systemic and implicit biases. And there exists unequal opportunities for students, um, especially early on within an undergraduate setting. And these differences in access to opportunities really creates a widening gap between um, people, and especially people from historically underrepresented groups as they progress within their careers. And so I guess this really touches upon the idea of that oftentimes uh, for a lot of these trainee awards, such as graduate federal awards, their aim is to um, recognize research potential within students, but oftentimes it rather rewards research um, ability and research merit, such as through GPA, publications, research experience. Um, and so there is a really big push, especially in, in recent times, to kind of shift that focus of trainee awards away from uh, only looking at some of these traditional metrics of academic excellence and more towards identifying potential within students and especially identifying potential using metrics that aren't exactly or specifically academic, but you know, taking into account a variety of alternative academic experiences that people may be coming, uh, people maybe have before coming into graduate school would level the playing fields more and, and make admissions and scholarships a lot more equitable. Um, as well, there is also a, a very big concept, particularly within academia, that uh, having one award or one scholarship does lead to often you get more awards and scholarships down the line. Um, but if there is a discrepancy early on, such as within graduate uh, awards, this gap pretty much widens as uh, students progress into uh, associate profs and, and tenureship positions. Um, it's the lack of uh, awards and scholarships at an earlier level can really disadvantage people from getting access to those awards later on within their career. Um, as well, when we were writing this memo, one thing that um, we were really looking at was, uh, so within Canada uh, for the federal research awards, they do release demographics of award winners. Um, and what we were uh, noticed very early on was that the demographics of these award winners doesn't match up with consensus data within Canada for things like gender, visible minority, uh, indigenous status or disability. Um, and while this is a very indirect comparison, um, if we look at a statistic such as, so 39% of the population within Canada uh, identify as women and as a part of a group of visible minorities. But then if we look at the demographics of award winners uh, for federal graduate research awards, um, in particular winners of the master's award, only 14% of these award winners are women uh, who are also a visible minority. So there is a really big discrepancy there that you know, is not being addressed even at this point. And so um, within our memo, we touch upon several recommendations that hopefully um, increase the level of inclusion and equity within uh, award winners of, uh, of these graduate awards. And so the first recommendation that we wanted to, um, we want the Tri-Council, so the funding body within Canada to make, would be to broaden the eligibility duration in particular for doctoral students. So what this means is uh, within Canada for a lot of our federal awards, you can only apply to them within often the first two to three years of your graduate degree. Um, but what that really does is it rewards students who come in with a lot of you know, pre-doctoral research experience. Um, and it also disadvantages students who are less familiar within the funding system coming into graduate school. So if we um, increase this duration in which students can even apply to these awards up to four years, which is what we put in the memo, um, is that would pretty much allow students uh, more of a chance to develop their application within graduate school uh, and have access to opportunities that as an undergraduate, they may not have had access to um, in order to strengthen their application. 
Um, the second big recommendation that um, we really talk about in our memo is focuses a lot on reevaluating the criteria for students who even uh, get these awards. And so often, so within um, these awards, there's something called academic excellence, which is often, you know, a combination of GPA and research output through publications, um, as well as in general research experience. But this really disadvantages people who are coming in um, from, you know, a place where they did not have access to research uh, opportunities within undergrad. Um, for example, you know, students who had to work uh, as opposed to uh, unpaid volunteer experience within labs, it already creates a pretty big discrepancy in their, uh, in, uh, within their applications to sh demonstrate their research ability, um, but it might miss upon a lot of, um, you know, alternative academic experiences that they may have, which could speak to their ability to succeed in graduate school. So it, within the memo, we do discuss in part with specific details related to each of the awards on how they could expand some of this criteria to include a lot more um, characteristics and metrics that don't uh, particularly adhere to, you know, strict traditional academic standards. Um, and so this does actually also include non-traditional academic research outputs. So often publications are the only way that um, people consider uh, your, your research uh, potential or, you know, um, your research abilities. But there are, uh, especially in recent years, uh, a bigger push towards considering alternative metrics such as, you know, uh, data sets that you release your research, uh, creation of software uh, that you've um, put together within your work, which doesn't directly translate to publication, but it does have an impact on science and research. And, you know, this can also include things like um, science communication and, you know, how well did you communicate some of your research findings, even if they weren't directly put into a paper. And so, yeah, so this the second recommendation really touches upon broadening what we really consider academic excellence. And then the, the third recommendation, which I will only briefly mention, uh, we talk a lot about how the graduate uh, federal awards within Canada, they need to increase their award values and need to increase the number of awards. And the biggest motivation behind this is that uh, federal awards in Canada haven't been increased since 2003 which is a very long time for inflation to create a very big discrepancy. Um, as well, there's been tuition hikes all of these years, but the amount of funding that we've had access to has remained the same. So if only to keep up with inflation, the award values do need to increase, but also with the cost of living going up in every major city, um, without increasing award values, this really disadvantages students from attending certain universities simply due to the cost of living being too high. Um, and as well, if we increase the number of awards available, uh, this does also, you know, open up the number of award winners and potentially we could uh, create more quotas and more opportunities for students to apply and get these awards. Thank you. That's all I will say. And hopefully within your questions, I can answer anything I've missed. Great, thank you for that presentation. I think there's a lot of valuable knowledge here. So we encourage you to read the memo, but I do wanna delve a little deeper into some of the concepts that you brought up in the recommendations. So obviously you propose to broaden the eligibility and evaluation of uh, federal student awards, expanding, increasing the um, eligibility duration, as well as value, uh, award values. So I'm curious about this concept of evaluation. Um, you know, how would you define excellence and what sort of factors should we weigh when we think about merit criteria for federal awards? So I think value, you know, sort of, like I said, the longer timing, higher, higher amounts, um, you know, what other um, criteria should we be thinking of? Yeah, it's a really good question. And I think what we really have to keep in mind when we talk about, you know, redefining some of this criteria is that, these awards are for trainees. They're not specifically for, you know, big name researchers in the field. These are for students starting out their career within science. And so um, it almost doesn't really make sense to uh, 
specifically evaluate students only on things like how much research experience they've had or how many publications they have, when the goal of graduate school was to develop those abilities. And so um, within especially our recommendation number two, so reevaluating the award criteria, what we did um, specify is that, uh, first of all, alternative academic experiences should be more heavily weighed and considered. So, you know, if you've had a part-time job in undergrad or even a full-time job to support your studies, it does speak to a certain level of dedication and hard work, which are key skills that come into play within graduate school. And so it's considerations like that. Um, as well, uh, oftentimes, and especially people who are part of marginalized groups or who come from historically underrepresented communities often spend a lot more of their time dedicated to social justice issues and causes within their community. And these are not things that most you know, graduate admissions or scholarship committees explicitly consider just because this is not something that people you know, even put on their CVs oftentimes because of the expectation that this isn't a professional skill. However, these experiences really do, you know, inform who someone is as a person and, you know, their, their ability to make change in the world, their ability to communicate and speak. And so I think a lot of these alternative academic experiences and metrics highlight someone's potential um, and not ability, which I think is going to be the key in increasing equity in a lot of these awards. Yeah, that's a really good point. And I think there's a lot of interest um, from trainees to address some of these topics. Uh, so there's a question in the chat that is sort of related to my original question, but in terms of thinking about how do we make this more actionable, you know, what would you recommend the government do to uh, accomplish some of these recommendations? Obviously, we want to talk about, um, you know, equitable distribution of awards. And then, um, our audience also asked about eligibility in terms of um, what do you think about excluding some eligibility, not listing previous awards to remove award bias, which is also related to this. Yeah, that's a, a really good question. I mean, oftentimes when we write these memos, our, our biggest concern is, you know, will someone listen? Will this actually result in meaningful change, especially when we're talking about the federal level, which often has a lot of different layers to get anything altered. Um, and so we're actually very fortunate. So right after we published this memo, we reached out to the presidents of the Tri-Council within Canada, so our funding agency. And um, we're actually meeting them next week to talk about some of these recommendations. And what I really view this as is, you know, to get the conversation started because Oftentimes there is a really big disconnect between what graduate students experience and feel. And you know, these lived experiences oftentimes cannot be translated directly to statistics that these funding agencies collect. Um, and so I think having more of an open dialogue between graduate students and funding agencies is a really important tangible step to get our voices heard. Um, and what I what personally would like to really see from these federal um, agencies is for them to collect better data, demographic data on graduate students as a whole within Canada, just to better inform, you know, do the demographics of their award winners actually match up to the demographics of graduate students within Canada? Um, I think that kind of information will be really key to making these decisions. Um, and in terms of actually change like the changes that could come about a lot of the changes that we recommend are you know changes to the application itself and changes to the criteria so they don't have to do with you know acquiring more funding or you know adding more money into the system it's it's more about like how can we refine some of the wording and the language and the evaluation of these applications um, but the flip side of that is, you know, you do have to provide much better training for the people who assess these applications. So it's usually the professors uh, at universities who assess these applications from students, and they often have implicit biases and unconscious biases that, you know, there's not sufficient training provided to them uh, throughout the application process to make sure that there is a meaningful you know, mental change within them when they're looking at these uh, award criteria. 
Yes, very important. So that um, feeds into, I did want to ask a couple of sort of broader questions around your memos and think about the common themes that we discussed here today. So um, in the context of this conference and more generally, um, can you talk a little bit about um, why DEI is important in terms of you know, broad science policy decisions and making sure that policymakers center their decisions around DEI? How can we um, achieve that? I can, I can go. Um, when we don't, center policy decisions around DEI, then we often end up having unintended consequences on the groups that are most historically marginalized. So centering policy decisions around DEI is important for policies that end up benefiting society as a whole and not just the most privileged group of society. I think um, this really connects to Emma, you were talking a lot about the top down approach in which, you know, DEI tends to get addressed. And so not considering DEI within every policy that we try to make within the, our country, it leads to a lot of problems down the line that people then try to fix from a top down approach. And so it becomes this cycle of like band aid solutions instead of meaningful change from the beginning. Totally. It's definitely some an issue that is systemic and needs to be addressed at every level and in every policy. So that's what we advocate for at Science Policy Exchange. Great. And thank you both for those answers. So just in the last couple of minutes, um, I want to touch a little bit upon your experience with the journal uh, in case our audience is interested in publishing. Sort of how has the process been for you? Um, what do you think the value of your publications is for your own careers in science policy? And obviously, we always seek to uh, provide additional training um, to our authors. So if you also have any recommendations as far as what sort of um, tools we might be able to provide to the authors. I can start, Emma. So um, I've published two papers so far in the last year, year and a half within uh, Journal of Science Policy and Governance. Uh, my experiences have been overwhelmingly positive. Uh, the submission process is very smooth and there's a lot of support provided to authors to make you know, adjustments uh, and refine the article because oftentimes you know, the people who submit are trainees and, and students. And so it's really nice that the editors are completely aware of this and, you know, try to nudge us in the right direction as opposed to just like telling us what to do. It's, it's a very like learning process, I would say. And I absolutely love the model of JSPG. I mean, without the existence of this journal, I really don't see any other big like formalized space for students to begin a career in science policy. Um, coming from a STEM background and I'm doing a PhD, Entering anything related to policy two years ago would have been very unknown to me. This the process is a little, you know, mystif mystifying. Um, but having this journal that is so encouraging um, and you know allows you to officially publish articles, it you know it helps you kind of like kickstart your career, but also lets you learn along the way. Yeah, I would just want to quickly add, because I know we're out of time, that um, it's really awesome if you don't have experience writing policy memos, because they have a lot of different workshops that you can take part of um, leading up to the submission of the issue that you want to submit to. So that was really helpful for me, because this is my first time uh, officially writing a policy memo for publication. All right, thank you both for those remarks. So I do want to just um, in the last minute tell you about some of our future um, efforts. So we currently have a ongoing call for papers for re-envisioning STEM education and workforce development for the 21st century for a special issue sponsored by Sigma Xi. We have a deadline in January, so you can look at that here. I'm happy to... Um, talk more about that. And in preparation, uh, we actually have two webinars. We can go to the next slide. So one is actually today 
moderated by Toby Smith on higher education for 21st century workforce. And then next Friday, we'll have another one um, that is on community college education. So you can see, uh, see that on the next slide. And then um, we will have um, also a writing workshop early November. So this is the website to keep up to date with um, events coming up. And as Emma said, we do have these events as part of our special issues. Um, and just to close, I wanna uh, encourage you to stay in touch with us. I uh, would be happy to talk to you about opportunities with JSPG and um, hope to see you at some of our future events. And then I'm gonna share all of our um, channels as well to keep connected with us. And thank you for joining today.